So if Jenny is watching from home in real time, which I don't know if she is or not, our, our uh, little pup was spayed and she's on dog duty. We have, a, we have a new puppy, Piper. She's just fantastic. She's not so sure about me. She loves everybody else. It's one of the genetic deals within the uh, Australian Shepherd. Like, if you're not on their team, in their head, they're going to let you know. And so we're, we're slowly working to get me on the team. I'm not sure what happened. But um, if, she, if she's watching live or whenever she does or hears about this, she'll be mortified to see that I'm wearing a Breathe Right strip on my nose. Because if you come every Sunday, you know that there was, a, there was a Sunday earlier on in the year where I had this on my face. And I didn't break my nose. And I still haven't. And we had a conversation about that afterwards. She's like, I know you thought that was a good illustration. Please never do it again. And, and though this week I just felt like this was, I hope, what will help make this connect, connect for us in a memorable way. Good or bad, memorable way. And so if you would open your Bible and meet me in Galatians chapter 4, actually. Galatians chapter 4, and then we're going to get our way very quickly back to chapter 2. I love it when, I, lo- I just love it when somebody's phone does something. I just heard chapter 37, and God bless our technologies. So, there's this little phrase, it's a throwaway phrase, um, in that Paul is not teaching this, it's like, this is what I need you to know, this is what I need you to think, but this phrase has stuck with me, and I would like to encourage that it might stick with you, and it's in Galatians 4, 19. And so I'm going to begin right up. I'm going to begin in verse 16, just picking up in the middle of Paul's thought. He's talking to the Galatians about his pastoral love for them. And he says, have I then become your enemy by telling you the truth? They make much of you, but for no good purpose. They want to shut you out that you may make much of them. It's always good to be made much of for a good purpose. And not only when I am present with you. So he's making a point in this about the relationship with the false teachers and, and how they were looking at them, how they were looking at Paul. And, and he says, so in, anyway, that's where this little phrase happens. In the flow of that thought, he says, begin in verse 18, it is always good to be made much of for a good purpose. And not only when I am present with you, my little children, for whom I am again in the anguish of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. And that's the little phrase. He, he's, he says, I love you like my little children, and I am in the anguish of childbirth for you until Christ is formed in you. Until Christ is formed in you. The title of the sermon this morning, Christ-centered, Christ-Centric Living in 2024. What would it take for Christ to be newly formed in you? Today, tomorrow, in a new way. Not in a New Year's um, resolution sort of a way. What would it take in your life for you to enter a season, a spiritual formation that was different and distinct and significant in your life in a way that set it apart from everything else that you have experienced in the Christian life. What would, what would that take from the Lord? For, for Christ to be formed in you in a new way. Because Paul's writing to Christians in the Galatian church. My little children for whom I'm in the anguish of childbirth until, until Christ is formed in you. And so it's clearly a way that he thinks about discipleship. It's a picture that he has for what it means to grow as a Christian. So think about that. Uh, 
Um, I, I know that everybody here, I think, gets my emails. Mostly everybody does. And so if you didn't know already, but you knew from the emails we sent in the last few weeks that, um, that Deanna Blythe had um, double lung replacement surgery. And we're a small enough church family that we kind of all know each other, and it's not that you need my email to know that that, that was something that happened. By the way, it went really well. She got home sooner than they expected and that they had told them. So that's kind of indication of like, hey, this <laughs> things took <laughs> in the right way. And of course, it's a long, long, long process, but, but it's encouraging news for her. That idea of having something significant inside of you changed. For her, double lung replacement. Or you might, you might be, you know, like the one that is the transplant that seems to happen more often than not is like a liver transplant, you know? Um, it's amazing the things with modern technology that we can do to keep people's bodies going or to improve health and life for people. But this idea of a transplant is one of them, and that's not exactly what Paul is talking about. It's a new heart is a great image in Scripture for salvation. What Paul's talking about, though, it's like something inside of you that is essential and core to who you are if you are a Christian at all. So I'm a Christian at all. I know I'm a Christian. Okay. What would it look like for Christ to be formed in you in such a significant way at age 47 for me, at age whatever for you, that you look back later and you go, I don't know how it happened exactly or what was that kicked that off, but boy did, boy did it change for me and what it meant to know Christ, what it meant to follow him. Till Christ is formed in you. And that's an ongoing process throughout all the days of our lives. Now, with that as the foundation, flip back page or two to Galatians chapter 2. And we have one of these verses that's just a, just a, a gospel verse that's a, in the nugget, like an like a acorn seed in the ground form of, of something so small in words but unpacks into the major elements of the Christian life in one verse. We have one of those verses. There's scattered throughout the New Testament, but we have one of those in Galatians 2.20. And so I'm going to read what, what Travis also read earlier, Galatians 2, 20 and 21. Paul writes, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I live, the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. If you look at your note sheet, you would see that the four points on the note sheet are just this verse unfolded with some blanks. Now, I want to give a warning that this is one of the sermons that um, there's going to be extended scripture reading in this sermon. And, and I say that not because it's a problem, but you really want to be reading along with me. It won't be on the screen. I'm talking multiple chapters we're going to read in the next 30 minutes together. You could hate this sermon very easily and get into the Charlie Brown wah, 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 wah mode of listening. Please don't do that because I want this morning to stir you up towards the possibility that Christ could be newly formed in you. And I think that Paul, through his words, and the Apostle John, through his words, have that for us. So please, as we go through this morning, please do turn with me in your Bible or your phone to the passages and read along with me. Um, please track, because otherwise, you're going to hate the sermon, because this, there will be quite a bit of Scripture reading. But if you're reading with me, I think that, I think that Paul and John make this point better than TJ. And so we're going to unfold this verse, Galatians 2.20, in four ways. And so beginning with the first, where he says, I have been crucified with Christ. 
I was thinking this week, one of the things that I don't know that I talk about in the proper balance in my preaching, for that matter, or in my life, um, is the concept of being crucified with Christ, being a slave unto him, the mortification of the flesh and therefore new life in him. I mean, we all have certain things that we talk about more than other things. Um, and I was just thinking this week, and especially looking at these two passages of Scripture we're going to read, I thought, man, that is so, that is so core and I think underrepresented in how I talk. And it really brought it to mind, and maybe it will for you too. Would you turn over uh, to Romans chapter 6? And I want you to turn there, and I also would like you to turn to 1 John chapter 3. Romans 6 and 1 John 3. Those are, those are the places where we're going to, to go for this, this portion. Listen to how Paul talks about what it means to be dead unto sin and yet alive unto God. Romans 6, 1. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let not sin Therefore, reign in your mortal body to make, your, to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourself to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law, but under grace. What then are we, uh, are we to sin because we are not under law, but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, then you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? But thanks be to God that you who once where slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. And having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness... So now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God... And I've got an exclamation point by this last little part of my Bible. But now that you have be been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen, Amen is right.
I've been crucified with Christ. That's a longer explanation of what that means. Pornography. Constant focus on the things of the world. Loving money the wrong way. Prioritizing things and possessions, career the wrong way. Idolizing and pedestaling your family and your kids and making that perfect. Lacking honesty because it makes it work out better for money. There are so many ways to miss it every day in the Christian life. Most of what I just mentioned is an internal sin without, with external fruit. I'd love you to be stirred up this morning that you have been crucified with Christ. And so everything involved with all of that belongs to the old dead you. And you get to pick if you're a slave to sin or a slave to righteousness. A little bit more. Would you flip over to 1 John 3? 1 John 3. I'll say, you know what? We're not going to read this whole chapter. We're only going to read half of this chapter. I'm going to back up actually to 1 John chapter 2, verse 28. When I went to Bible college the first year, um, uh, when I went to Bible college, I went to Bible college, and the first year, Jenny and I both went to Word of Life Bible Institute. It's a one-year Bible program. It's awesome, and the, one of the things they did then, I'm sure they probably still do, is you memorize a chapter of Scripture while you're there. I believe that the year that we were there, they wanted the focus of this chapter of Scripture, is memorizing all year, to be about um, the imperatives and the call to get your life right and to live in light of the grace that's been given. And so this passage always rings to me in those areas because it's just something that's been in me since that time. 1 John chapter 2, verse 28. And now little children, abide in him so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink from him in shame at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that Everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God. And so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. And what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous, as he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. And the reason the Son of God appeared is to destroy the devil's work. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning. For God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. By this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. And then there is a section on loving your brother where he takes the same brush and applies the same sense of imperative like, no, really, this is what a Christian is and does. And then he ends that section, beginning in verse 23, um, John, 1 John 3, 23. He says, and this is his commandment, that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another 
just as he has commanded us, whoever keeps his commandments abides in God and God in him. And we know, and by this we know that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us. I have been crucified with Christ. That is Paul's way of unpacking dead to sin, alive to God in Christ Jesus. Over here, the old, the old man, the old self, the old flesh, dead, done, no longer engaged. Over here, the new life in Christ. If we died with him, well, we will also live with him. And we can live with him now, and then in a fuller way, we'll live with him then. I have been crucified with Christ. And then John says, we are called the children of God. Yes, we are. And what that means is righteousness has come home for us. And we walk in it. And we live in it. And, and the ones of us who know him in a real way have the spirit in us. And the way that you can see that is they walk in righteousness. I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. That's, that's why we read so much scripture this morning, is I think they say it so much better than I do. I'm reading a book. Um, called Sheetrock and Shellac, A Thinking Person's Guide to the Art and Science of Home Improvement. I am a huge nerd. I also have a breathe right strip on my face, which we'll talk about in a minute as an illustration, and hopefully it makes sense. But I'm a nerd, and I'm reading this book, and I actually kind of like it. But there's this section in it that I thought really connects to what we're talking about this morning, that I've been crucified with Christ. And, and it's no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. Microwave ovens didn't just change the way people cook, they changed the way people eat. That's not what anybody would have guessed in 1946 when Percy Spencer, an engineer at Raytheon Corporation, who during World, the Second World War had played a big role in the development of radar systems, noticed that electromagnetic radiation emitted by the experimental vacuum tube, had melted a candy bar in his pocket. Subsequent experiments by him and others showed that high-frequency radio waves excite the molecules in water, fats, sugars, and certain other substances, causing them to heat up, but have little or no effect on plastic, which I would say, I don't know about that, I don't put that much plastic in the microwave. You do what you feel appropriate. Um, they have little or no effect on plastic, glass, paper, or air, and are reflected by metal. So in 1947, Raytheon introduced the first microwave oven, commercial model, which weighed nearly 800 pounds and was the size of a refrigerator, cost several thousand dollars in 1947. Raytheon called it the Radar Range, a name submitted by an employee in a company contest. The oven was used mainly in restaurants, railroad dining cars, and the galleys of ocean-going steamships. And it was not an immediate success. Eleven years later, an admiring article about Percy in Reader's Digest cited two applications that no sensible microwave user would ever try twice, suggesting that the article's author had never seen Percy's invention in operation himself. Here's his quote. The new device will cook a sirloin steak in one minute and a plump Thanksgiving turkey in little more than half an hour. Well, that was really funny because uh, I wouldn't do that with steak. <laughs> Amen. Christ-centric living will not happen for you in a microwave fashion. You cannot nuke it. Does not just happen. And I would confess to say that I feel the challenges of living a sharp, crucified with Christ, no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. 
those challenges are just as real for me today as they were when I was 17 and all of this was new for me in 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 an experiential way. It's just as challenging. Challenges are different. I was I was 17 year old as a high school kid walking around school and I would wear this cross thing on my chest on like a I was a very public late high school Christian. I sometimes look back on that and I'm like, well, that's what the Lord was doing in my life. There's other times I look back on that with this like cringe thing. Like, you know, you would have had some more friends that endured past high school if you wouldn't have been such a Jesus freak that last 18 months of it, you know. Um, but but that's what God was doing in my life in those days, and that's what um, that's when he lit a fuse in me of wanting to walk with him in a real way, you know? I'd been raised in church, and I had done all the stuff that you did, too, if you were raised in or around church. But I, it was in those years that it became very concrete, personal, and real for me. But that was 30 years ago. The challenges of it are just as real for me today. And I would say they're more subtle. For me, if I want to become ungodly in my external life, I will become unemployed very quickly. So that's sort of off the table. The, the real challenges for me of living a crucified with Christ life are about the internal aspects of things and those things which would only live in the darkness. But they're just as real. And if I approached my Christian life with a microwave ethic and mentality, I will quickly fail in it. I will quickly be on the ground needing to look up and, oh my gosh, there was a time, there was a time when I actively walked with God. And what happened? If you are approaching your Christian life or the Christian aspect, the spiritual component, the core of who you are. I did church. Got that prayer book. I definitely will pray. Maybe I'll read some. I'm going to get around this year is the year I'm going to get around with my kids, my adult kids, whatever aspect it is. I'm going to show up and volunteer at the pantry. Or you know what? I have a beautiful voice and nobody knows it and I'm going to get a microphone and sing in church. This is going to be my year. That's all microwave stuff. It won't work. It won't last. And here's the real thing about that. It isn't Christ-centric living. It isn't, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. It isn't, may Christ be formed in you. John ends his passage there, and we read it. He says, and by this we know that he abides in us, by the spirit whom he has given us. Christ in you and the spirit whom he has given us, the the triune God. I do think there are distinctive things to say about that. Well, Christ in you, there's an element of this. and The spirit in you, there's an element of that. But it's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three in one. And I think, thinking of Christ in you and thinking of the Holy Spirit in you, to simplify things, you can think about it as the same thing. It says in Romans 8 that the Holy Spirit is the spirit of Christ. By this we know that he abides in us by the Spirit whom he has given us. So you go back to Galatians, Galatians 5. Galatians 2.20 is our verse, but Galatians 5, this is um, the the last long passage we're going to read. In Galatians 5, Paul unpacks in the fullest way in the New Testament what living in the Spirit looks like. Galatians 5.16. But I say, walk in the Spirit. And you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit. And the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For those are opposed to each other. To keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. 
sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. Let's just pause there and say there's other places in the New Testament where there's lists of sins. So I was just to say to you is like the the works of the flesh are evident. For just a moment, without going down some sinful path, consider every internal sinful of the flesh temptation or aspect of things that you know you could go down because that's one of the areas where you have temptation. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The work of the flesh is evident. Now, also, think of any of the external things. He he translates drunkenness and this and that. Think of the external, lived out in real life, weaknesses of sin that you know you've had or that you know you could. And let's tell you, they're different for us. But think of yours. Oh, gosh, I could struggle there, and I have struggled there. I really fell down in this area of my life. Okay. Like in Galatians 5, 19. Now the work of the, the works of the flesh are evident. Everything Paul listed, and then also your particularized view and version of it. Verse 21, I warn you as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, Patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there's no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. For I have been crucified with Christ. Verse 25 and 6, we're so great. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking, and envying one another. Now, this morning's sermon has started with the demanding, challenging reality of what it actually means to live the Christian life. You're a Christian? Great. Stop sinning and walk in righteousness. And here's how you do it. I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I. It's Christ who lives in me. It's Christ. It's the Spirit. God has taken residence in me, and He brings this fruit. And he gets rid of that fruit. This is what it all looks like. This is what it all means. And we're going to end in a moment with grace at the communion table. But I want to take a couple minutes here and talk about the part of it that depends on you. The part of it that you do influence. And I would say not influence, control. There's a part of this that is of God. The beginning the drawing of you, the helping you grow. That parable of the sower, the seed goes out. And there's some that are hard, and there's some that have thorns, and there's some where it's rocky, but there's some that's good soil. There's, there's some parts of it that you don't control. <laughs> but when you wake up tomorrow morning, you're going to do some stuff, whatever it is. And in the middle of the day, you can do some stuff, and in the evening, more stuff. But unless you're fasting, at each of those times, most of you will eat. Now, somebody here has got a weird eating schedule, I'm sure, but like, you're mostly going to eat in the morning and at midday and then in the evening. And you're going to do other things too. Back on our note sheet and back in Galatians 2.20, and the life I now live, I live by faith. In the life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God. I love how Paul talks about living by faith in Romans. One, he says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, first for the Jew and then for the Gentile. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. By faith living, 
is all over the New Testament. And we could talk about, and we will admit at the end, the content of that faith. But I want to just challenge you that living by faith in the New Testament view is about enacted, enacted lived out faith. It's about love in the sense that you love people actively in a healthy family, in a healthy uh, home life, in a healthy marriage or whatever. Like in your home, like, I love you. Well, that's not love. I love you. Did you steal all my stuff again? I love you. Now think siblings here. Where are my shoes? You know, like there's a way to say I love you and then there's no love. Live by faith is an enacted living out of active faith, which brings us to this ridiculous breathe right strip on my face. I mentioned this earlier in the year, but um, I've never been a person able to breathe through my nose. Knuckle dragging mouth breather my whole life. Allergies as a kid and all kind of stuff, whatever like this. Probably things I could have done somewhere along the way. I didn't. And then so I've never breathed through my nose like in an active way in my life. And then early in the year, last year, I I learned, uh, and this is a true thing, you get a lot, you get, you get a substantial different uh, proportion of oxygen through nose breathing than you do through mouth breathing. And there's other effects as well. And I'm like, wow, I wonder if, I would notice a difference. So I started wearing these things. And I did. And it really became a thing this last year that I was like, different times ebbed and flowed, but I became excited about it. Because it changed the way I slept, and it changed the way that I felt, and I realized, like, wow, there is, there is something about putting um, yourself back in a driver's seat, especially as an adult, with something that you know is life-changing. There really is something about it. That could all be true, but if I was not going to do something about that, it won't matter in my life. And so I have to decide now, when am I not going to wear this thing? So you won't see it again, because it's ridiculous to wear this in public. And actually, one of the things this last year that I was making a mistake, I was wearing these into the office at, at New Life Gehenna. And I won't say who, but there is somebody there that when they look at me on those days, I know they're judging me. Like, like they're judging me. They can't help it. They're like, you look retarded. You look really, really dumb. What are you doing? You can wear that at night, at home, whatever. You won't see it again. The life that I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me means enacting those things in your life that are going to cultivate a by-faith heart and a by-faith mind and a by-faith set of practices in your life so that with Paul you can say, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. There's one other part of this. I have, with this Breathe Right strip thing, the joy and passion of a new convert. Have you ever met one of those? Oh, my gosh. There's certain things, like uh, being a vegan is one of them. I think I've heard this, like, a cliche thing. Like, if you would like to know who of your friends is a vegan, just wait because they're going to tell you about it. Eventually. There are things that are like that, right? It doesn't have to be that. If you are vegan, God bless. I, you know, but I'm, I'm simply, like, there's certain things that when somebody gets into them, it's sort of like, oh, they're going to start. They're gonna, they can't stop talk, not talk about it. They're going to get really excited about it. This is an example of that, although I'm really, you know, going to control myself. Actually, I have, a, I have a New Year's resolution, which is resolution, which is I don't want to tell anybody anything anymore. Because I talk too much. So this will maybe be the end of it for me, but... I have the joy and the excitement of a new convert about this thing with breathing because actually it's making a huge difference for me in some health things in my life. It really is. Okay. So this morning, on the way here, I wasn't planning to, but I gave this little seven-minute, like, dad talk about that to my daughter. Like, okay, dad, you know. 
I have the joy of a new convert. The practices involved with this are involved with changing something physical, intangible in my life. In the Christian life, microwaving it won't work. In the Christian life, doing the, I've showed up and I've done this stuff, 30 seconds, go, nope, not enough. Okay, 30 more seconds, I got. You will feel immature as a Christian. And you will wonder, I wonder why this doesn't work for me in the way that it seems to for others for decades. Because the Christian life is only meant to be lived as a Christ-centric, fully engaged fire kind of way. All of the New Testament writing comes in the context of persecution and opposition. This is a life that you can have, but you have to enact the by faith practices to make it so. So my question for you is, will you? Will you? This year, and I, I think it's really nice that we can start that off with a really clear, small, simple. Will you over the next three weeks? I will not belabor this, but I just want to tell you, people of faith, by faith people, crucified with Christ people, Christ lives in me. The Spirit lives in me. Then people pray. I talk a lot about the difficulties involved with prayer. Because the reality of it is, it hasn't been the easiest part of the Christian experience to grow for me. The different objections that you could personally have that would cause you to be less engaged in prayer, I think I've had. And I've had to, I navigated those from the perspective of being a I wear a cross on a chain high school kid and then all the way into the, into the ministry. Do pray. I understand those who really struggle with it. There are those who have the gift of faith. And I never thought it was me. <laughs> there are aspects where we have a natural and maybe God-given ability through the fruit of the Spirit or just through who God made you as your personality, whatever. They come easy. And then there are those other things that you have to enact, work for, and be engaged with. I do talk a good bit about the challenges involved with that. I know I do. That's where it comes from. That's where it comes from. But crucified with Christ, Christ in me, the Spirit in me, I live by faith people. They pray. What's really cool about these books and, and the, the thing we're about to go into I'm just going to, I'm not going to read all of them. There's a couple, just going down the chapter titles. These are just the titles of these chapters. Give me success today, the prayer of Eliezer. Go with us, the prayer of Moses. I have sinned, the prayer of David. Give me wisdom, the prayer of Solomon. Deliver us, the prayer of Hezekiah. Answer me, the prayer of Elijah. Have mercy on us, the prayer of the blind men. Increase our faith, the prayers of the disciples. God, have mercy on me. A sinner, the prayer of a tax collector. Father, forgive them. Prayer of Jesus. By faith, people pray. And the, the 21 days of prayer that we're going to do is something that Pastor Steve kind of began to uh, craft for all of our campuses, and we've been talking a lot about it internally. Now, these next three weeks is where it will happen. And I just want to challenge you. There's this thing called keystone habits. And keystone habits are the habits that if you put them in your life and you actually succeeded, it will teach you personally that no, you can change something in your life. So this is a keystone habit for me. Like, wow, that, that was great. I actually figured something out 
What can I add to that mix? You might want to do 10 spiritual things different. But if you could do one, it would make a huge difference for you. Because if you did one thing different in a sustained way, even for just three weeks, you will show yourself, you know what I can do? I can change. I can do differently. I can still repent in a way. Like, that's what that is. I've been doing this, not doing, but I'm going to engage it as somebody who wants to be that in a better way, in a different way, in a fuller way. Anyway, I wanted to stir up and get the juices flowing this morning for you, if possible, in the power of God and the Spirit. The last note on your note sheet is the last part of the verse. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me, who gave himself for me. And that's where we come to the communion table. I think one of the reasons why at the beginning, and I mentioned this, that I talk a little bit less about the deep, challenging piece of the Christian life, the call to righteousness, the, the Romans 6 stuff, the you're called to live crucified with Christ stuff, is that at the end of the day, knowing that there's a high bar that I am called to in the Christian life hasn't made the difference for me than knowing of the deep, deep love of Jesus and the grace that pours out from the cross to me and the power that pours out from the resurrected Christ to me and everything about what we call the gospel is what changes life for Christians. And so when Paul told them how to come to commun the communion table, he, he said in 1 Corinthians 11, he said, for I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. The central place of the practice of communion for the Christian is in one way about remembering the last part of this verse. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live. It is Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And I would just tell you, if this lands for you, the rest of it is possible in a whole new way. Because without a deep understanding in a personal way that you are loved by God through Christ, because he gave himself for you on the cross, I mean, there's just a lot of obligation, isn't it? You are called to this. You're called to that. All the things we read in Romans 6 and, and, and 1 John 3 today. That's a heavy load upon the back unless, unless it is instruction on how to live out the loving response to the deep love of God that has come for you. Oh, the deep, deep love of Jesus, which is vast and unmeasured and boundless and free. It's free. It's full. He loved you. He gave himself for you. And if that lands for you, just like if love in a human relationship lands for you, just like if love is healthy, say, between you and your parents or you and your kids, like there's just a piece of you, if that's true, you're like, I want to figure out how to make this tangible. I want them to know. I want in my life to enact the love that I have for them. If this lands for you, enacting the love that you have for him and looking to put by faith practices into your life, oh, it won't be hard. So we come to celebrate that every time we pick up. 
the bread and the cup. I'm going to pray, and then if those who are serving or those who are going to be up here, go ahead and get where you need to be. Father, we thank you so much for the deep love of Jesus. We thank you for the bread that represents his body and the cup that represents his blood. We thank you that every time we hear or deeply consider the high call to righteousness and the deep challenge to walk out what it is that you have given to us, to to work out in our faith what it is that you have put in to us comes with the presence and power of the Holy Spirit, comes with Christ in us, comes with a clear path given by faith and that you lead us in truth and you lead us in our lives to how you would have us to respond to you. I, I just thank you for the deep love of Jesus. I thank you that he loved me and gave himself for me. I pray as we respond this morning that you would work and move in hearts and that you would give us grace to love you and see you in ways that move us to action in life. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.